you know, as a 20 year old at that time, a feeling of what is this karate all about? That's all I heard anyway, it was karate. And what's that all about? It was so mystical. And then I happened to be walking along Hancock Street in Boston. And I looked up this plate glass window and I saw karate, Madison Academy of Karate. And I just thought, oh, I've got to get in there and, and do something, you know, sign up, see how it is. All right, everybody, welcome. It's another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. On today's show, I'm joined by Hanshi Al Wharton. Thank you for being here, sir. If you're new to what we do, please check out WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for every episode we've ever done. This is episode 900 and who knows what? I don't know. Andrew might know. <laughs> 958, maybe? You you knew before, you knew before I did. Right. Because you're, you're watching or listening to this later. And of course, all the things that we do to connect, educate and entertain the martial artists of the world can be found at whistlekick.com. Mm. Thanks Absolutely. for being here. That's impressive. <laughs> well, it's, it's like martial arts, right? You, you just you keep showing up. If yeah. you go back to the early episodes, I was very much a white belt. OK, <laughs> it was okay. sometimes people will, you know, as new people find the show once in a while, someone will email me and they say, you know, Mm -hmm. I watched a new one, yeah, and I listened to because we didn't even do video in the early days. And I listened to an old one, gotten a lot better. <laughs> and that's the way martial arts should be. It's a way of life, yeah. and it's a progression from Juq to Judan. Yeah, and that's all of the for sure. progression for sure. So, what's your your Juq journey started? When? Where? Why? Yeah, that started back in 1969. In so Boston, a couple days ago, a couple of days ago, Boston, Massachusetts. You know, I had always had a, you know, as a twenty-year-old at that time, uh, a feeling of what is this karate all about? That's all I heard anyway. It was karate, and what's that all about? It was so mystical. And then I happened to be walking along Hancock Street in Boston, and I looked up this plate glass window. And I saw Karate, Madison Academy of Karate. And I just thought, oh, I've got to get in there and, and do something, you know, sign up, see how it is. And they asked me to, to just do this movement. And so I did the movement. And they said, you can sign up. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was, that was your, your test to sign up? Could that you, was my test. Could you, could you punch with a little bit of rotation? I'm, I'm coordinator. Sure. Or, that was that was it from then on i i just uh trained four times a week so i i, I have to ask uh because you don't I, i've lived in new england my whole life you don't have a boston accent no i don't <laughs> no i have a my accent is actually a mixture of i was born in the west indies sent kids and then my aunt and uncle, they brought me to Bermuda okay. uh, when, at age 11. And then I uh, picked, so even the Bermudian accent didn't yeah, I... take ownership. And then I lived in Boston for about five years, yeah, back to Bermuda. So I've got a mixture you, of blend. You do, and, and I can hear a little bit, you know, the, the way those R's round off at the end. <laughs> And now I'm in the UK. Right. So right, and that's when <laughs> when we met a few minutes ago. Yeah. I, I mean, I just assumed you would have a British accent, and you didn't. And I went, no. oh, oh, this is <laughs> this is going to be interesting. So yeah. you started karate in the late '60s yeah. in Boston. You know, not that Boston has really ever been the roughest place on earth, but yeah. I would imagine in the '60s, mm -hmm. as a man of color coming from over, you know over some some water i don't know if we call it overseas but yeah. international mm -hmm. was your interest in training self-defense no it wasn't you know at that age at that time for me personally my experience up to that point was not one of being involved in a lot of uh, racism and that kind of thing you know the only way I started to wake up to racism was 
going to the film, the movie cinema, and looking at some of Sidney Poitier's movies under the yum yum tree and these types of, you know, films. And then I started to wake up, oh, there's uh, things that are not quite uh, <laughs> as equal as you think. So that was my first, yeah. We, we had a, a conversation with some of the, the folks who tested as masters on Thursday night. We did this last night. And one of them brought up the idea of equity mm. and that martial arts was, in their mind, one of the few places that they see equity. And, and, it, and it's really got me thinking that I noticed this, this quite a bit. Was that your experience when you, you started training? Of course. Once I started, I didn't feel or sense any kind of uh, inequity. So it was quite wholesome to me. And uh, of course, I thought that it was just the one martial art. I thought karate was karate. I didn't know there were many different styles. Of karate. Yes. Fortunately, I picked a good one. <laughs> you did. You did. Part of a good group of some good yeah. people. We're, we're having an absolute blast this weekend here. Did you fall in love with it immediately? I had to have because I, I started off and <clears throat> I did like four classes a week. Really? And I, I had instructors. My first instructor was Jim Maloney and Victor Moulton, Bob Campbell, Boss Durkin. These types of people, they were all there at the visa. And, uh, Sensei Matson was always there, but he came and board when you were like green belt, when you were Goku, then you can go to his classes. He was doing more of an advanced class. And uh, so my two main instructors in Weichi, uh, Jim Maloney and George Matson, they are my two. And now George Matson, because he's, he's like 86, 87 years old. And look at him. You, you like, wouldn't know it looking right. at him. So I like to look at people like that and think, hmm, hmm. that's what I like to be. <laughs> you know, so yeah, I'm very happy to have done four classes a week. So, so you're kind of all in mm, at all that in. point. Conviction personified. Is, is that how you are with other things too? Yeah, but even in my... Uh, electrical business when mm. I, I was involved in that uh, in the early days all in you know I, so i try to do everything all in weichi my electrical business and then i also did the kung fu so i did okay kung, this is news i did kung fu one year into weichi okay i don't know the student friend <clears throat> from Africa, and he had seen a demonstration. He came to me and he said, Oh, wow, I saw this demonstration. It was really great. Uh, they want me to come by on Monday night. You come with me. Sure. Okay. Of course, their classes are at 11 p.m. Mm. So, anyway, we got there, <clears throat> and I looked at this up seven flights of stairs, mind you, small room. And I looked, I thought, I like what I see. Mm. <laughs> and uh, I want to do that. So at that point, I had the choice to cut back on my four times a week and maybe do two times with them. And they did three times a week. And I decided, I'm still doing my four times, and I'm going to do the three times. So you're training seven so times a week. Times a week. That's so I, I'm, I'm wondering, Boston, Kung Fu, that time, mm -hmm. who are you training with? There aren't a lot of options. <laughs> in, in Boston? Yeah. Is that in Chinatown. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And uh, it was, uh, and most of these masters, you would never know, they're like a chef or something like that, you know. And so my, he's, uh, my chef, my teacher, uh, he's passed away now. But uh, 
we had this class. It's 11 p.m. on Monday, 11 p.m. on Saturday, and 3 p.m. on Thursday afternoon. Now, the average person couldn't make those classes and because of the way that I was living there in Boston. I had the time. Uh, it wasn't really conducive to my lifestyle with wife and so forth. Yeah. But the passion was there. I had to do it. And the styles are so different. This one was Northern Shaolin Kung Fu. And I'm doing Wei Chi Wu, which is a southern style of Kung Fu, really. <clears throat> They're so vastly different. Yeah. I wasn't sure if this was going to turn into, you know, after 900 and however many episodes, they sometimes they connect. And mm -hmm. I, I thought, is this going to connect back to Baos and Mark? <laughs> we've, we've, we've had some episodes that have, have talked, about, talked no. about her. So the the... The northern versus the southern Wei Chi versus you said Mantis. Did you say northern Mantis? Northern Shaolin. Northern Shaolin. Yeah. Um, were they different enough that well, they were so different that... that it was easy, or were they different enough that it was difficult to do both? No, they were just difficult enough to separate. And so I made the decision right away not to tell any instructor at Wei Chi that I did this, and this instructor that I did this. So I kept them both separate. Neither one knew. They didn't, did they figure it out? At some point <laughs> down the road, a uh, few people started to figure it out. Yeah. And uh, because I had to compete in tournaments and stuff like that. But, hey, I think that's the only way you can give each system what's due, what, what is required of each system without comparing prematurely, you know, so you have to take on board what are the principles that make this system work mm. and this system work. You can't do too many systems, but yeah, maybe a couple you can do. Yeah, yeah. How, how <clears throat> when did you start to notice them kind of blending for you because I'm, I'm sure eventually yeah. you started pulling right. pieces and together. in the back of my mind you know decisions made early in your mind is very important yeah. so i decided when these two will harmoniously blend on their own without me prompting them then uh that's when it'll happen and it's still doing that to today it's still blending so if we see your Wei Chi, if we watch you do Sun Chin Kata, mm -hmm. is it going to look a little, little more Chinese than maybe some of the other? No, I had a, I had a, in San Francisco, I went to do an electrical seminar, and there was this uh, Tai Chi person that I had always seen in the magazines that he had a peculiar kind of Tai Chi system that he created. And I thought, hmm, I'd like to meet this person. I met him, and he, you know, took back to his place, and uh, we started talking about karate, tai chi, kung fu, and he asked me to do a bit of my karate form, and then a bit of my kung fu form, and then he afterwards he said. How do you change your body like that? <laughs> how's, how's that? Because I want to be true to the karate and I want to be true to the kung fu. While there are some things that are going to slip through and blend and, and sort of tie in, that's just going to be my personality. Yeah. It's going to be me. And I can't avoid that at this stage. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, I, I've done a lot of cross training and. I spent some time in, in Taekwondo, in ITF Taekwondo, which has, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, they call it sine wave, this up and down movement pattern. And mm. I spent a lot of time trying to make what I did look like <laughs> Taekwondo, but it, it always came through as karate. And, and I'm very mm -hmm. fortunate that the Taekwondo instructor I trained with had mm -hmm. also started in karate. So mm -hmm. he, he would say, no, but I do like what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, you know, I did... Uh... 
I did three things, actually. I did, uh, well, I've done more, but upon going back to Bermuda after doing my time here with Wei Chi and Northern Shaolin, then going back to Bermuda, mm -hmm. At that time, the predominant styles were <coughs> Shotokan and Goju Ru, and not much else. So, after a year or so, I started to put on tournaments and oh. these kinds of things. How, how long were you, had you been in the U.S. training before you went back to Bermuda? I was back to Bermuda in 75. Okay, so, so five, five years, years, yeah. 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 And... Uh, I said, okay, uh, I had introduced my brother to a Shotokan master in Boston. And so he was involved with the school in Bermuda with Shotokan. And I, I, it intrigued me, Shotokan. I thought, hmm, let me do it. At least do some parts of it. I can't do the whole system, but I can get the flavor, the essence of the system, what it, what it is all about. <clears throat> and it is harder system than Weiji. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, Weiji, by its name, Pangai Noon, is hard and soft. Mm -hmm. you know, so Shotokan, I think, the way that I, 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 I viewed it, when I did Weiji, I was sort of like, mm -hmm. my focus was intense. <laughs> it was like deep. And uh, <clears throat> when I did Northern Shaolin, I was like, Broad, this expanse, this, you know, I want to jump high, kick, sweep, do all kinds of stuff. And then when I did Shotokan, I was like, I want to break down the door. <laughs> you know, I just, I want to just go in hard, you know, yeah. and, uh, yeah. So what, what was really interesting was as you walked through those three, I could feel your energy change. Okay. Yeah, that was that was really kind of cool. Did, did you pick up on that? Yeah, yeah. And Andrew's over there for those, for those of you <laughs> okay. watching. Yeah, you you kind of switched modes, mm -hmm. and that's something that, in my experience, I've been training a little while. Mm -hmm. I don't know too many people who can do that, make that switch that quickly. It's usually mm -hmm. very difficult. Anybody else ever told you that that that's well, that is an uncommon <laughs> thing that you have? The person that I told you in Chicago that I did. Yeah. Uh, he mentioned it. And, sure, uh, sure. I'm sure people mention these things, but I don't pay a lot of attention. Yeah. So your training now, is it still these compartmentalized things? Do you still make an effort to keep things separate? Not as much. Not as much, because now I've evolved to a place where I, I, I really don't need to keep them separate. Mm -hmm. I should try to blend them more, because... You know, you've only got so much time on the planet. Sure, know? sure. And uh, you want to blend them so that they all start to express you or you can express yourself through them. You know, so whether it's uh, Wei Chi, which is predominant, because that's what I, I'm fully ranked in and uh, so forth. Uh, the Kung Fu, I never reached the highest level, uh, but I had enough of it to understand, uh, and the Shotokan, same thing, uh, <clears throat> Chen style, Tai Chi, uh, Bagua, mm -hmm. these things, they all tie together, and they all blend and allow me to shape myself. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's... When, when we go back to, and I wasn't around, but mm -hmm. I've talked to enough people who were, talk about the martial arts culture in the 70s in the States, there wasn't a lot of cross training. It was kind of the beginning of the Bruce dojo Lee. wars, dojo yeah. storming, right? Yeah. Like like this yeah. sort of thing. But you went back to Bermuda. Was it like that there too? Was it very siloed that people yeah. kept to themselves? Very much so. Okay. Very much so. You know, and the Bruce Lee era was just coming into play, and uh, so. There wasn't a lot of cross training or any cross training at that point. So you start promoting tournaments. That that almost seems like it might have had uh, uh, some additional 
motivation for mm -hmm. some of these schools. If they're mm -hmm. keeping to themselves and you're hosting a tournament, mm -hmm. now they don't just want to win. They want to win for their, so their right, style, for their, their school. Style, right? <clears throat> so, yeah, I had to, after that, even that cycle of tournaments evolved over years, I would start with posters. And it surprised me, actually, as to the number of schools there were in Bermuda. 21 square miles, small place. I've been there. Yeah. It's a cool place. Good, yeah. But on my poster, I would have like 25 schools invited. That's, that's a lot of schools. Or branches of, yeah. of the Goju, the Shotokan, the you know, Kung Fu, Wing Chun came into the picture and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> so that was quite a blend of schools in Bermuda. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm sure worldwide it's the yeah. same thing. Yeah. And, and what did, what did those tournaments do for the martial arts culture in Bermuda? Well, in the early days, of course, it, it made people more aware, very exciting back in the early days. Sure. Because you know, people are there now, you know, they line up and see the different schools, uh, different uniforms, and, you know, and everyone's proud of their school and they're representing. Uh, today, it's a lot different. Uh, not as much, you know, not as much that same uh, sense of, uh, of awe. <laughs> yeah, it's not there, I don't think, as much. How long were you putting on tournaments? Uh, my last tournament was like my 13th or 14th uh, annual. I might have skipped one year here and there, but uh, yeah. And what were you doing for your training there? Were you teaching? Did you have a school? Were you training under somebody else? No, the teaching. When I got back to Bermuda, <laughs> I initially taught the Kung Fu because the Kung Fu was you know, the thing that Bruce Lee mm -hmm. and that, you know, people seem attracted to that a lot more. So I started with the Kung Fu and uh, after about a year in, someone came and introduced themselves to me and said, look, I hear you do Weichi. Could you start a school in Weichi? And he pressured me and <laughs> Okay, because I was already doing the Kung Fu three times a week. And I'm married. And, yeah. Okay, so I did the Wei Chi and it was twice a week. But same I, space? Ran right out of the same space? No, no. no. Two, two different locations? Two separate locations. So. At, that, at that time, yeah, two separate locations. See, actually, I never did it. In, two, in the same place. I always had two separate locations. Why? Was that conscious? That's just the way it worked out, and subconsciously I didn't mind, mm. I guess. It's the way I probably wanted it anyway. Yeah, it's, as, you know, you, you said, you didn't use this word, but inevitably, with enough time, stuff's going to start to blur together, and I agree yeah. with that. That makes yeah. sense. But I don't know that I've ever talked to anyone who had two or more distinctly different martial arts systems well, that kept them different. Well, as actually, teacher, maybe as in all fairness, uh, it was done because that's all I was able to do. Okay. You know, I wasn't able to do more uh, of anything in that one facility until I took over that facility. Okay, you were limited by yeah. when it was available, I understand. So forth. And then I had this other facility, the Weichi, which was quite nice, a nice little place and it blended in quite nicely so I didn't mind it was so out of the way mind mm -hmm. you but it happened yeah. and if we were to go back and kind of sit on the outside and watch you as a martial artist mm -hmm. and how you're developing mm -hmm. with what you do during during that time what would we be seeing what changed for you as a practitioner Uh, as a practitioner after or before early I, stage or late stage? I guess through that, that time, mm -hmm. how, how, how long did you live in Bermuda 
during that. Well, from that 75, 76 until a year ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's a long time. That's a long time. <laughs> and up until a year ago, were you teaching still? No, I, I, uh, I actually had a kind of sending away. I was going to move from the Bermuda to the UK in 2014, 15. And uh, that's when I had a big you know, gathering, happy short films of the past 20 years and all that. And, uh, retirement. I you moved. Know, retirement. Yeah, pretty much retirement. About 10 years. Uh, I moved to the UK, but my partner in business, uh, he passed away. Mm. I went back to try to salvage that. It just never worked out. Yeah. COVID came along and all that. It just nothing really. Worked COVID out. derailed a lot of plans. Yeah, yeah. And then while I've been here in the UK, though, I have had a lot of success in in getting invitations to train or teach at different dojo. So just recently, actually, I decided I'm going to do my own thing again. I only have a few years left that I can probably do it effectively. Let me do that uh, starting this October. Is that a reflection of martial arts in the UK or the UK overall? I, I don't have a lot of experience, you know, been once. Yeah. I don't know why, really, to be honest, I don't know why. I'm really in the IUKF, which you, I'm the highest ranking person in the UK and in Bermuda. So I don't know why someone would say, oh, would you come to my Jojo and teach the class? <laughs> you know, I don't know. It's not up mm. to me to even figure out. So all I can do now is I'll do my own thing. Yeah. And I'll express it the way that I have evolved. And it'll be a blend of the Wei Chi, and I'll also teach a couple of the Kung Fu forms and so forth. You just used a word that's, that I've heard used a few times as we've been here this weekend that I don't generally hear with martial arts, and that's express. Express? Express. Expressing the movements. Yeah. Is that a Wei Chi thing? <laughs> don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but it it's, it's, could be, but... You know, it's for whoever you speak to that recognizes that there is something within them that uh, they would like to uh, teach mm -hmm. or show, you know, demonstrate. It's a feeling and understanding that one would have. And how you express, how do I express my Wei Chi, Kung Fu, Tai Chi, how do I express it on a one-on-one -on -one form? How do I express it teaching you, let's say, as a white belt, that you want to learn Wei Chi? Yeah. It has to be more Wei Chi. <laughs> yeah, I have to teach you Wei Chi. And then if I teach, if you were Kung Fu, teach you Kung Fu. But if none of that bothered you and you would just wanted to learn something, I'll teach you what I have and I'll express it the way that I would express it. <laughs> yeah. I, li I like that word, I do, because it suggests that even within a system where there's rigidity, like mm -hmm. the form is done in this way. Yeah. It still acknowledges some individualization, and I think that that's important. Something yeah, that I appreciate, important. and and I've trained at schools that would never use that word, that would never acknowledge that. In fact, they want the opposite, and and mm -hmm. you know, to be direct, those tend to be schools that come from a mainland Japanese mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. lineage versus the Okinawa. And maybe you maybe you're right in a way, in the sense of uh, someone asks me about. What is it like to be ranked Judan? Mm -hmm. Because Judan is rank, part of your rank. You go from GQ to Judan. And Judan, if I look at all the Judans in this system, 
you couldn't find two alike. <laughs> you know, they're all different. They all express their own thing. You can still see the similarities. Of course. But you still. very well can see the differences. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we all walk different paths up the mountain. And it's, uh, you express what you came through. I've always appreciated that metaphor of, of the mountain and, and for the audience that might be unfamiliar. And, and yeah. If you see, if you see the metaphor differently, let me know. But I was taught we're all at different points around the base of the mountain and it, what we see looks so different, but the higher we go, yeah. the more we can, Oh, you're, you're over there. And it starts <laughs> to look more similar. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. How much more mountain do you have? I, well, in this system, so to speak, I have no more mountain. I have sky. I have, I have more, you know, there's a lot more. So I'm at the base of the top of the mountain. So this is more spiritual. This is more. Spiritual. So is that what keeps you motivated? Oh yeah. It keeps me motivated because otherwise, if you feel like you have accomplished something, you've reached the pinnacle of something. You may not want to, you know, you just slacken off, you don't want to continue. But in all of my training from Juku to Judan, every rank that I went through, Niku, Sanku, all the way, Goku, all the way up to EQ. When I got EQ, I was the worst Sanku. I was like a good Sanku or Niku. But the worst EQ, very sub basement level, son, or EQ. So I uh, look at that everywhere. Shodan, Nidan, become Nidan. I'm a good Shodan, but Nidan. You have to grow into it. Otherwise, you give yourself growing space. Yeah, I didn't even want to be Judan. Uh, Why? Or. You know, I was happy with eighth Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I felt eighth Dan is a good rank. No, I'm happy with that. But then I was invited to, and I've never asked for an invitation to the eighth. I've always been invited. I, I did the eighth Dan, and then you start to settle in with the ninth Dan. And, you know, that's why there's time between ranks and grades. And then now Judan. And so I'm just a, a baby Jew then. <laughs> <laughs> and it makes sense, but it, it's that's such a uh, an interesting concept <laughs> for me, this idea that, you know, right? Because when you're lower down on the mountain, yeah. you can't see the contrast right. of the people beyond you. That's and, and, that, and that's something that as an instructor, I find really interesting trying to convey things to my students and having to remember, hey, they're not here, so they they simply have to trust me. They they don't they don't have the context for a lot of what I ask them to do. They they show up with faith. That's right. You have to, you know. I'm doing my seminar. My seminar is on basics yeah. and insights. I couldn't just say basics because there's no growth in that just on the surface. Mm. So I say and insights, mm. because insights come from repeating your basics over time. And so I, uh, <clears throat> when someone hears basics, they think boredom. They think, oh, geez, I've got to do that again. You know, and you block out what it is he's trying to put in there. So if you do your basics with a beginner's mind mm. at all times throughout Judan, Juku to Judan, keep a beginner's mind every time you go back to basics, insight will definitely happen. Yeah. It has to happen. Understanding is only, uh, you know, let's go three steps. Knowledge, understanding, wisdom. Mm. That's the growth. Break, break that down for me. Okay, so knowledge. Because a lot of people would use those words interchangeably. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but knowledge is just information. Mm -hmm. It's just information that you get, and it's quite in, in today's age versus when I started. Oh, knowledge has expanded profoundly. So then knowledge, 
understanding. Understanding comes through repetition of this information that I've gotten. I keep repeating that, and then suddenly, understanding is revelation. So the revelation is, aha, that's what that means, you know. And so you go on. Now wisdom is like the who, what, when, where, why, and how you do stuff, and being wise about it. <laughs> You're being. Yeah, you know, okay, I'll do this at this time, not that time. I'll do this is how I'll do it, not that way. You know, when, where, why. And uh so therefore wisdom is application. So you've got information, revelation, application. That's the three steps. So if I can if I might extend your metaphor and apply it to, to basics, mm -hmm. knowledge is I've been taught how to do the punch. I know it exists. Understanding is I can do the punch on my own, and and wisdom is I know when to do the punch. <laughs> we should probably end there. That was good job, me. That was yeah. Good. That was good. Yeah. yeah. And and the reason I I wanted to take it there is you you made a statement that so many people find basics boring. Mm -hmm. There there's this. Um, you know, a bell curve, right? And, yeah. and I see an inverted bell curve when it comes to basics. New mm. students, they're they're happy. <laughs> oh, they're happy. But they keep going, and, and their interest in basics just <laughs> drops. Mm. And then they're going, come on, give me something new. What? But they, they will... <laughs> hang out there long enough that it comes back up, and they go, oh. oh yeah. Because what, what I have found, and, and I share this, I think we've talked about this show on the show a number of times, mm -hmm basics or fundamentals mm -hmm. foundation mm -hmm. if you're going to build something tall if we go back to that mountain metaphor how do you build the tallest possible mountain you have the strongest possible foundation and if that's your basics your base if i want to go further i need to spend more time down here and when i connected those dots i went <gasps> and, and here we are now i've been yeah. training a few decades and I spend most of my time mm -hmm. taking a kick, a block, a punch. Mm -hmm. And how do I, I mean, you use the word insights. Yeah. How do I pick that apart mm -hmm. in a way that makes me go, oh, there's the revelation. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and just to, for, for those of you out there, if you're, mm -hmm. if you're in that bottom of the bell curve, right? If you're, if you're going to class and you're saying, oh my God, I know how to do this kick. I know how to do this punch. Mm -hmm. I am so bored. I am so frustrated. You don't. <laughs> and I would encourage you to to recognize that there's no there's always more knowledge. Always. There's always more knowledge, always. which means there's always more understanding more than, and always more wisdom. More knowledge than you can even shake a stick at. The yeah. Knowledge is there. Yeah. Right? And now you have to be wise also in how you choose that knowledge as well. Yeah. When you actually as you go through this Judah Juku to Judan space. You gain insight, you gain understanding, revelation, wisdom, and now you can go back and yeah. pick and choose. It's this is reminding me of a moment, and it, it's as a as a kid training. Mm -hmm. One of the most pivotal moments, I think, in hindsight, for mm -hmm. my upbringing as a martial mm -hmm. artist, I was probably seven or eight, maybe eight. Mm. And I remember the very first black belt that my instructors promoted. Mm -hmm. He'd had a black belt in an existing school. So he, he was about four years mm -hmm. after training that he earned his black belt. And I remember my mother saying, let's go congratulate Jean. Mm -hmm. We went up and I remember her saying, how does it feel? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I'd been, let's see, four years. So I was a blue belt at that point mm -hmm. she had started training she's probably a yellow belt maybe a blue belt and he said i realize how much i don't know <laughs> yeah and and talk about talk about a revelation an epiphany mm -hmm. and that has stuck with me mm -hmm. I mean, it's close to 40 years That's and i think true. that statement more than anything else i've heard as a martial artist yeah that's uh that's having the empty cup, mm. the empty mind. The only thing that you can have a full cup in is love, generosity, mm. kindness, 
these kinds of things. You can have a full cup because every time you try to pour something in, it spills out. <laughs> you know, so it reflects, right? So, but when it comes to lots of other things, you can't take on board what's coming in that's helpful if your cup is already full and it's full of all kinds of negative things or, you know, self-promotion and all of this. So it's good to be empty, have an empty cup, open mind. You know, even when you do your kata, this is open. You know, this is no, I'm not trying to even do things where, ah, you know, there's someone coming at me with a knife and I'm going to do a block, you know. I'm doing my block, but <laughs> it's open. If you want to step in with your knife, it's fine. <laughs> you know, but I'm doing the kata. The kata is just for me. It's for how I grow and how I understand. Take it back to that statement that you said, the only thing you can have a full cup of is love. Yeah. That's not the first time you've said that. No. 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 Speak on that. That is that is a powerful yeah. statement, and I want to make sure, because I don't want to miss it. I Forget <laughs> the audience at this point. Yeah. Talk about that. Well, think about it. Love is everything. Right? And if you can't share love, even in even a white belt, you know, and a, an instructor and a white belt that uh, you're teaching uh, the white belt, mm. he may be teaching, he's got his empty cup, and you're teaching them technical things and skill things. But if you teach it with love, mm. if you express love while you're teaching it, his absorption is going to be even greater. <laughs> you know? And so definitely you being a person of love will move many mountains mm. that way. It's it's not something I have analyzed even for myself, but it's something that I know, love, gratitude, kindness, these kinds of things, you want to keep your cup full. We were having a conversation last night with someone, and, and we've continued the conversation, the two of us, this, this notion of fun within mm. martial arts. And, 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 you know, the fun changes over time, yeah. but fun being... You know, my, my contention that fun being a necessary component in the way you teach. But what I'm wondering as I'm hearing you, is fun merely a way of implementing love? If you're yeah. teaching with love, mm -hmm. that suggests a lot of things. Empathy. You're doing whatever you need to to reach that yeah. person. Right. And sometimes that is fun, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes but it's it can not. Be, always be love. Yeah, you've always, you know, tough love. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Got know. a lot of that in my day. <laughs> it's just the love. So love conquers all. And I think it's a good way for people to uh, have the, the backbone of whatever they teach should be through love. Yeah. What are your, your martial arts goals seems like? overly simplified word, but, you know, what, what are you, what, we'll, we'll run with it. What, what goals do you have well, for goals, your training, goals, your school? Goals, uh, like I, I tell students from time to time, goals. Someone said, ah, my goal is to become Shodan, or Nidan, or Godan, or whatever. And my answer is, just do what's required to go from EQ to Shodan. Just do the requirements of your system or whatever. Just do it diligently. And Shodan will become a consequence. Don't have to think about goals. Don't be chasing the goal. Just chase what you have to do and let the goal be a consequence of what you do. So if you It'll automatically be a consequence. I've never had to ask for one rating from QQ to Judah. I just did whatever Sensei Maloney told me to do. Bob Campbell, George Matson, 
I just did it diligently and I tried to seek understanding and seek wisdom. <laughs> Find value in the process rather oh, yeah, than... Yeah. And just do it. And, and then when you go up for grading, <clears throat> yeah, it's not an if you're going to get graded. Hey, I've done everything you've asked me to do. I think I'm doing it quite well. Uh, I expect to be graded. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's, <laughs> takes a lot of mystery out of it. This is a question I asked some of the folks last night. How does your enthusiasm for your training now compare to your enthusiasm at points in the past? Well, you know, as a as a 25 or 8 year old training it's so much information <laughs> so much uh, you think understanding or you, you're chasing understanding you want to understand more and more and uh, the wisdom part is not even kicked in yet it's just understanding and, and knowledge and you're chasing that. I've done that most of my life, chasing that, that, and the wisdom part. Some people have it early. I personally, not that early, but uh, the enthusiasm has always been there. And uh, because I always feel there's more, I don't have enough understanding. My cup of understanding is half full, which is not there, you know. Uh, so when you keep your understanding cup half full or even less, you have room for more understanding. <laughs> you know, if you if you're understanding, you think you know it all. Well, good for you. Uh, <laughs> and in that moment, you you do you understand everything that you are capable of at that moment. <clears throat> That's why I say to a class, if I go to a class, okay, the purpose of today's class is to defeat yesterday's understanding, you know? Hold, hold up, pause. That. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And that would be the purpose of every class, is to defeat yesterday's understanding. So you're open. I'm open for a new revelation. I'm open for everything. Don't uh, deny yourself that opportunity. <laughs> I, I think we have a, a an excess of sound bites for this episode. That, that it's not too often that, that one of them punches me like that. That I go, oh wait, hold on. You're not just watching or listening to this. You're part of it. Okay, hold on, Jeremy. Do your job. <laughs> That's kind of how I'm feeling right now, which is. You know, a, a, a cool feeling and, and, you know, is the way I approach my martial arts. I, I, I've never articulated it that, that well, but it's also the way I approach this, right? I try to make sure that every time I do an episode, I'm a little better. Yeah, yeah, you know, we talked right. about that before we started yeah, recording, right? Absolutely. You know, bring in that, absolutely. that Shoshin, that beginner's mind absolutely. to everything, that yeah. white belt mentality. That's generally what we call it on the show. Yeah. And that's what allows people to go from convenience to conviction. Mm. That's one of the C's in my basics. So you have a lot of students that they train from an angle of convenience or I don't have anything else on tonight, or whatever. It's convenient. Even coming to the seminar is convenient. I can do this. But conviction is different. Conviction is, I will do this in spite of that. This is what I want to do, this is what I must do, and I will do it. And so conviction and convenience cannot reside in the same space. At some point, one has to go. <laughs> sure. so, and that's uh, so very important. I will always try to alert students to try to gravitate to conviction. Mm. It's very hard to be convicted and gravitate to its convenience. Mm. <laughs> Most people don't do. You're convicted, you'll probably always be convicted. Yeah. You can start at convenience, but you need to gravitate to it. Don't stay there. 
you have to gravitate towards conviction. You want to become an Olympic athlete or any kind of star athlete, you can't be convenient. It's true. What do you want the folks in the audience to take away from our chat today? Well, whatever they need, <laughs> mm. whatever part of it that uh, fills the void, take that away. You know? And don't look at it negatively in any way. There's always something, a nugget somewhere, yeah. something. <laughs> you know? So whatever is helpful, look for that. Take that away. Thanks for your time. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> okay.